our communities build sustainable programs. As you may know, HUD does not provide funding for Connect Home USA, and so VISTAs have, have proven to be a really critical component. And so for this reason, I'm really excited to bring this session to you. You'll get an overview of the program, and you'll hear real-world examples from three Connect Home USA communities that have benefited from having a VISTA. Um, but before I introduce the panel, I'd really like to take a moment to recognize two individuals who have worked tirelessly to bring all of these sessions from day one to today to all of you. That is Kayla Prendergast and Michaela Miller with uh, RTA Provider Enterprise. I'm sure you've heard their voices over the past four days and hosting the webinars, but there's a lot that they've done behind the scenes that you wouldn't necessarily have seen. So I want to thank them for their incredible work and support. And um, if we were in person, I'm sure we'd all give them a big round of applause. Um, so now with that, I'm very pleased to welcome our panel. So first up, we'll have Julian Kubiak, who is the AmeriCorps VISTA Director for Serve New York. She'll be followed by Zach Magalanes, uh, who is the Connect Home Coordinator for San Antonio Housing Authority. Joan Davidson, the Community Relations Manager at the Akron Metropolitan Housing Authority. And Mindy Davis, who is the Management Assistant for Grant Administration with the City of Phoenix Department of Housing. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jillian, and thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dina. And, you know, just echoing thank you, Kayla and Michaela, um, for putting all this together. Like Dina said, my name is Jillian Kubiak, and I am the AmeriCorps VISTA Director at the Service Collaborative of Western New York, and we run the Serve uh, New York VISTA program. What we're going to be talking about, or what I'm going to go over really quickly with you, um, is kind of an overview of AmeriCorps. Kayla, if you can go to the next slide. Um, just an overview of AmeriCorps, if anyone hasn't heard of the program, AmeriCorps VISTA specifically, and, um, you know, some guidelines and benefits of the program. And then at the very end of the presentation, we're just going to talk briefly about the application process, if this sounds like a good fit for any of your communities. So AmeriCorps VISTA is actually, um, has been around since 1964. It was a JFK initiative that um, President Johnson established, and it is the counterpoint to the Peace Corps. So for those of you that have never heard of AmeriCorps before, it is basically the domestic version of the Peace Corps. And members, the goal of the VISTA program is for members to be living and working in, in communities experiencing poverty with the goal of eradicating poverty. And as Dina said, the Corporation for National and Community Service is the organization that administers AmeriCorps. There are a lot of different segments, so I wanted to pause and take one second to just talk about those. Under the Corporation for National and Community Service, oh, sorry, <laughs> I skipped ahead. Um, we have Senior Corps and AmeriCorps, pretty self-explanatory senior core focuses on um, retirees and seniors that do terms of service uh, serving in the community. And AmeriCorps has a couple different facets. Um, NCCC, which is the National Civilian Conservation Corps, they focus on disaster relief and um, more hands-on community building. Um, AmeriCorps State and National, which provides direct client-based services and AmeriCorps VISTA, which stands for <clears throat> Volunteers in Service to America, and is the only program that focuses on indirect capacity building services. So as I mentioned, um, the Service Collaborative of Western New York, we run the um, AmeriCorps VISTA program, one of many AmeriCorps VISTA programs throughout the country. And the focus of any VISTA program is going to be poverty elimination and capacity building. So we accomplish that through uh, placing 30 to 40 AmeriCorps members at nonprofits, government, and community organizations. We started based in New York, and now we're nationwide. And we focus on economic opportunity, 
And what we define that as is employment, housing, and financial literacy. We also have an education element focusing on academic achievement and preventing learning loss. Healthy futures, which is food security, healthcare access. We have a, a specific veteran and military focus and a opioid intervention focus. And in 2009, we at the Service Collaborative were very lucky to begin partnering with HUD and Connect Home to bring VISTAs into housing authorities nationwide. And through our first year from 2009 to, or 2009, uh, 2019 to 2020, we were able to bring 10 AmeriCorps members to strategic Connect Home communities, focusing with um, the housing authorities. So a brief rundown of, you know, I, I mentioned a little bit that direct service versus indirect service or capacity building, what that means. So if you had an AmeriCorps member working at your organization, some of the things that they would be able to do would include things like recruiting volunteers, training direct service providers, coordinating projects, public speaking, outreach, writing press releases, organizing fundraising events in any capacity, including grant writing, database development, organizing task forces and coalitions, conducting outreach, as I mentioned, and anything, anything marketing related that goes along with that. So these are some of the things that VISTAs can work on, because as I mentioned, there is a distinction between that indirect versus direct service. And just to break that down a little bit further, if you were to think about it, it would be kind of lumped into capacity building being strengthening, creating, developing, things like that, versus direct service, like tutoring, teaching, anything administrative and client interaction. So really the VISTA program is set up where a member would go into a community, work with uh, an agency or organization, and really try to help increase that sustainability there so that they're no longer needed, kind of work themselves out of, out of a job, so to speak. Um, but they're not meant to replace any full-time staff. And what a term of service looks like, so all of our members commit to um, a one-year contract where they serve full-time, 35 to 40 hours a week. They need to meet all of the requirements set by the sponsoring organization. So if there's any skills or ability requirements, it could be database, it could be bilingual. Um, they need to make sure they meet those. And they can be um, 18 or older. There's no upper age limit a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident, and they must pass um, a criminal history review. Great, and then finally, what is, it, what is in it for the members? If a person commits to a year of AmeriCorps service, they're awarded with what's called a living allowance. Currently, that living allowance rate is set at at least $13,399. And that is something that's paid for from the Corporation for National and Community Service and funneled through the service collaborative um, out to the members. Now I say that that is the baseline because it goes with the um, area median income. So in Los Angeles County, that is significantly higher than in you know Erie County where we're located in New York. And if members successfully complete a year of service, they're eligible for one of two things, an education award, which is $6,195 that they can use towards furthering their education or towards qualifying federal student loans. So that is a, a grant that they are eligible for or a cash stipend of $1,800. In addition to those, they are um, 
allowed to put their loans in forbearance, any qualifying federal student loans, and the federal government will pay the interest on those loans for their term of service. And then other benefits, professional development experience, we provide relocation assistance, both monetary and support related. There is um, a childcare subsidy, they're eligible for personal, health, um, personal and sick leave, health coverage, and um, all members that successfully complete their service do get non-compete eligibility status for one year for any government hiring. So that is pretty much all I have on the overview of the program. Now we're gonna turn it over to three different program, or three different sites that we've worked with in the past year. Some of them have members that have finished, some of them have members that are just starting, and they'll kind of go over what their VISTAs have done and accomplished at their site. All right, thanks. Thanks so much, Jillian. Um, reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, just go ahead and type them in the chat box and we'll, we'll save them until the end. Um, next up, we have Zach Magallanes from San Antonio. I'll pass it over to you, Zach. <clears throat> hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yep, sounds good. Awesome, thanks. Uh, yes, like they said, uh, my name is Zach Magallanes, and I'm currently the Connect Home SA Coordinator um, over at the San Antonio Housing Authority. Um, so good morning and good afternoon to everybody, depending on where you're at. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about our past um, VISTA member, Mr. Francisco Gallegos. Uh, he actually recently wrapped up his year of service. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about like um, his projects um, and, and some things that I mentioned here on the slide. So this is uh, Francisco Gallegos. He's right there on the right. Um, he did a significant and tremendous job uh, while, he was, while he was here uh, during his year of service um, and a few things that I mentioned on the slide. Um, a couple of things that he did that left a, a, a good legacy um, here uh, for us is he created a digital literacy, he created digital literacy content um, and curriculum in Spanish. So here in San Antonio and um, a lot of our residents, we have a large population of Spanish speaking residents. And uh, before him, you know, we were unable to, um, you know, serve them uh, in the capacity that they needed. Uh, and we didn't have any curriculum really in Spanish. And, um, you know, that was one of his first goals being bilingual uh, is coming in and, and recommending that we actually, you know, uh, create content for Spanish speaking residents. He was noticing that uh, a lot of the case managers were referring uh, residents who, who were Spanish speaking. Um, so, you know, he was tasked with um, uh, translating a lot of our curriculum that we have for digital literacy into Spanish and also creating, you know, documents and flyers and outreach um, uh, material uh, into Spanish. Um, and that, you know, helped significantly. Um, and he also taught uh, one of our digital ambassadors, which I'll get to next, um, you know, how to go about reaching um, and outreaching to um, our Spanish speaking clients um, and, you know, better helping them as well. Um, like I said, uh, he, men he helped mentor and guide digital ambassadors. Um, so here at the San Antonio Housing Authority, we have resident ambassadors um, who work part-time for the agency. Um, and in my, our program, um, they're called digital ambassadors because they work with Connect Home uh, and they work to help, you know, um, uh, bridge the digital divide with, uh, with our residents. Um, but when he came on, he met the four of our um, digital ambassadors. Um, and he led uh, workshops with them, uh, with myself, uh, you know, served as a mentor to them, you know, throughout the year. Um, a lot of our digital ambassadors, um, you know, come into the job um, hoping to learn, you know, skills that will benefit them for the next job or the next career. Um, and, and it's really to help prepare them to, you know, self-sufficiency. Um, and Francisco, you know, uh, served uh, like I said, as a mentor, uh, as a guide, um, anytime they had like a question, you know, he, he was always there to uh, answer the, their questions. Um, you know, we, we helped our digital ambassadors learn how to create PowerPoints, um, learn how to, um, you know, conduct outreach um, to different sets of clients, 
um, and he did various things um, that help our digital ambassadors, uh, you know, be more skillful in their positions. And then last thing that I have here, um, in addition to the, to the many, many things that, that he, uh, Francisco did, was help to recruit over 50 youth for two six-month STEM camps. So we were fortunately uh, able to partner with um, an organization here in San Antonio that provides STEM learning um, through a grant, uh, and we were tasked with outreaching to um, uh, many students, middle school and high school. And he really led that effort in um, working with our case managers, uh, along with myself and the digital ambassadors to um, uh, make sure that our residents first knew about the uh, about the STEM camp. Uh, made sure that we uh, outreach to the to the um, um, to the students, um, and you know we, we have various informal sessions um, so they can learn about the program, and uh, you know it worked really well. We we were able to do one in the fall. Uh, in the fall, uh, it was a 12-week STEM camp in which uh, 28 students participated over two properties, um, and then the one in the spring uh, we had another 12-week program um, where we had 35 students. So, you know, Francisco did a, a really good job in recruiting students and working with the case managers and myself and the digital ambassadors, like, like I mentioned, and, uh, you know, um, filling those positions or filling those spots for the STEM camp. Um, and he, he also, you know, helped out um, in a graduation event. He, he helped let, let, lead that initiative um, in the spring, I mean, in the fall. Uh, spring, we weren't able to have one due to COVID, um, but he really, you know, uh, put the logistics together and made that a, a great event for the students. Um, so, yeah, I, I, San Antonio Housing Authority has had a VISTA, uh, I think, since 2017. Um, and every year they have, they have you know, left a, uh, a legacy of their own um, and helped the program be sustainable. So I think that's all I have on my part, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, at the very end. Thank you, Kayla. Yeah, thanks a lot, Zach. Um, really good stuff hearing about what Francisco did with you guys at Saha. Um, okay, I think, oh, this didn't get changed. I'm sorry about that, Joan. Um, but yeah, this will be Joan Davidson from the Akron Metropolitan Housing Authority presenting um, with us today. Take it away, Joan. Everyone, thank you. And hello from Akron, Ohio. Um, a couple things to talk about. We have a current VISTA, um, Audra. She's about six months in to her one-year commitment. Um, and I don't think I can properly verbalize how impactful it has been having um, a VISTA worker for us. A lot of the staff dabble in Connect Home. We truly don't have the staff capacity to impact our residents like we would like to. So having a sole staff person to focus on Connect Home has been huge for us. Um, you know, Audra does, does lots of projects for us, um, everything from education to grant writing to marketing and outreach. Um, but there's two programs I want to talk about, one that's a little more immediate and one that's kind of, again, will be her legacy um, as far as the virtual volunteering. So we are ACAN, which is our Community Action Network group is our executive board of our resident councils. Um, keep in mind they're mostly made up of seniors um, who have not been able to meet or gather because of COVID. Um, but I think that's one thing to note too. We really have had to, what we originally proposed for Audra when we wrote our description and our grant proposal for our VISTAs, we really have had to be flexible and pivot based on the needs of COVID. So uh, again, we're thankful to have Audra to help us with some of those challenges. Um, she really worked with our ACAN agency to transition them to an in-person meeting to an online Zoom format. Um, she created a Zoom manual so the residents could look at it, you know, and determine if they could connect via their phone, their computer, their tablet. Um, it had very clear-cut instructions on how to access the meeting. And then behind the scenes, Audra was able to run the meeting on the technical side um, as the host, where she ran the PowerPoint, where she could mute and unmute participants, answer questions, monitor the chat box, um, and then offer real-time support. We had a call in line for residents who could ha were having technical difficulties. They could call in in real time and get some, you know, person-to-person -person contact. So 
that was huge. And I will say I sat in on that actual meeting on the first one, and it was so incredibly refreshing to see our seniors who've been isolated and not had a lot of socialization to be able to see each other on the screen and interact was just amazing. So we're continuing that format. And quite honestly, looking for to, to the future, we'll probably have that option available for the long term for residents who can't come to an in-person meeting. Um, the other big project um, that Audrey's been working on is virtual volunteering. Um, we have dabbled in volunteering for years, but never had a concrete system of tracking, screening, and monitoring our volunteers. Um, so we really relied on Audrey to kind of create this whole system for us. Um, she did some research, and we have um, been using Time Counts, which is a free website um, that you can create your volunteer application. Um, you can screen your volunteers, background checks, you know, your interview questions, do some tracking through time counts as well as training or signing training. Um, with that, Audra has as well developed some tiers of training. So for our virtual volunteering opportunities, we realize they really only need like an overview, a high level of training versus those volunteers that may in the future be one-on-one -on -one working with residents in a computer lab or what have you. Those volunteers may be, you know, four-hour training with pre-tests and post-tests. Um, but we're using, again, time counts to manage all of that. Um, currently, we have recruited about 25 volunteers. And our virtual program right now is that we accept their assignment through time counts. And then residents get to, I'm sorry, the volunteers are writing letters and cards, sending them to us. And then we are distributing them to residents who have been isolated or may not have as much social contact. So again, it's been virtual, no contact. The letters come to us. We screen them, make sure everything's appropriate, and then we distribute them. Um, longer term project that we're working on right now is a virtual story time when we engage volunteers to read um, from a list of pre-approved books where they can record themselves then we will in turn be able to push that out on our social media, um, potentially YouTube or the website to some of our younger learners. Um, we are a member of Book Rich Environment as well. So if we can get books into the hands of our youngest learners, that's truly impactful. And then again, to have space, um, someone reading the book is gonna be huge. We have a lot of details to figure out, but definitely something that we could not possibly do if we didn't have Audra on board. Um, those are two big projects, and again, I don't want to take questions. We'll take questions at the end, but certainly if there's any questions on how we've done these things, um, I'd be happy to answer. All right, thanks a lot, Joan. Um, next up, we have Mindy Davis at the City of Phoenix Housing Department. Go ahead, Mindy. Um, hi, Kayla. Hi, everybody. Thank you for um, having me today, I really appreciate it. So I am the Connect Home Program Manager for the Phoenix Housing Department. Um, this is the beginning of my fourth year managing VISTAs, working on activities to uh, build capacity within our housing programs. Um, today, I will be talking about my previous VISTAs accomplishments, um, some projects that our new VISTAs are working on this year, and providing some tips on how I integrate a VISTA into my team. Um, my first VISTA dedicated to Connect Home was Patricia Averett, and I was lucky enough to work with Patricia for two consecutive years. Um, when she began, we were in the, in the uh, early stages of Connect Home, and we had not received funding, held trainings, or distributed devices yet. So there was so much that we wanted to do, but, um, you know, we were struggling to find resources to be able to, um, you know, execute. Um, she and I bonded early over our passion for our uh, senior community, and it made logical sense to me to start with training because Patricia was a retired teacher. Um, she set out to find and develop curriculum that we could use in our senior digital literacy classes. Um, at that time, we had not identified a training partner, so we tested her curriculum ourselves at six senior sites. and. Um, we offered four-week classes and taught our seniors how to use email, create a Facebook account, um, and they learned about cybersecurity. Patricia adapted the training and materials to feedback that she received from 
uh, the participants in her classes. So typically having a VISTA teach classes would be considered direct service and not permittable. But because we were testing the curriculum and we were using feedback from the first round to modify and improve our materials, um, it was an approved activity. But we knew that if we were going to continue providing training that we'd have to identify a training partner. So Gateway Community College stepped up and committed to hosting a one day long training event per semester for our seniors um, at, the local, at the local college. Um, so that was the start. Uh, Gateway Community College was our first training partner. And at the first day, we had almost 30 residents participate in training. It was a really fun event. Um, around this time, the Service Collaborative of New York provided me an additional VISTA to work on our Connect Home program, and Brenda Johnson joined our team. Um, during her year of service, she focused primarily on conducting outreach, coordinating projects and events, and writing grants. Let me tell you, having two VISTAs was, was gold for me. So I, I really appreciated the work that they did together um, on our program. So last year, Patricia and Brenda completed five grant applications, um, one of which was funded and it allowed us to provide tablets and one year of internet service to 25 households at Eraterra Senior Village. Um, they were responsible for administering that grant. They um, uh, outlined the entire program, did the outreach for the, uh, for the program with the seniors, and they did a really great job. So um, over the year, they've created curriculum, they did a ton of outreach in the communities to generate interest in our program. And I, I personally feel that their biggest success was establishing a trusting relationship with our senior residents and creating a learning environment where our residents felt confident that they could succeed. Um, before their year was over, they also created a really great resource guide detailing the work that had been done in the first two years of the Connect Home program so that our incoming VISTAs would have a good understanding of what had already been accomplished and, and what still needed to be done. So Patricia and Brenda's year of service has ended, but they were able to make great strides towards program sustainability in their time with us. Um, next slide, please. So early this summer, um, the Phoenix City Council approved the use of CARES Act funding to provide devices and service to families with school-aged children to assist with at-home learning. And um, we purchased LG tablets with two years of service through our Connect Home partner, T-Mobile. Um, we also purchased additional accessories such as an SD card for expanded memory, a Bluetooth keyboard case, and mobile device management software. This summer, we successfully deployed 800 devices to households um, through scheduled appointments, all while social distancing. In August and September, at the tail end of our family distribution uh, plan, I was lucky enough to have Florence Luna from the Service Collaborative of New York and Nash Allen from Hands On Greater Phoenix join my team and pick up where Brenda and Patricia left off. Right before uh, Nash and Florence joined us, I found out that the department planned to request additional CARES Act funding to provide tablets to our senior households as well. Uh, the VISTAs have jumped in and they've already been a huge help in that planning process. And I actually have good news to share with everybody. We went to city council yesterday and they approved the purchase of 800 additional devices and service for our senior households. So, um, that will take our device total to 1,600 with two years of connectivity purchased through CARES Act funding. So Florence and Nash from day one have been assisting with vendor meetings, modifying the welcome packet and the user guide that I created for our um, family to receive tablets and adapting it so that it's geared towards our seniors. They've provided input on my distribution plan, um, they've made some fantastic recommendations for um, senior-friendly senior apps and bookmarks for our tablet, tablet image that will be deployed to the next 800 devices. Um, for those of you deploying devices, I, I highly encourage you guys to consider adding mobile device management software. Um, one of T-Mobile's partners, NextLink Communications, provided um, Hexnode software and support for us. This Indian software allowed for um, easy image deployment on the devices, 
tracking inventory, clearing passwords, remotely locking and wiping devices if lost or stolen. But the feature that sold me on the software is that I can broadcast messages to a single user, to all users at a specific property, or to every registered device in our program. I can push notifications that include links, flyers, surveys, videos. Um, this allows me to communicate electronically with everyone who received a tab tablet, even if they do not have an email on file with us. So I, I, you guys have no idea how excited I was about this feature. Communication is vital during normal times, and it is even more important now. So my VISTAs will be working with me to um, utilize this software to do community outreach um, over the next year as well. With that said, um, we have started working with Arizona State University to conduct a survey regarding internet access and usage during COVID-19. And my team will be able to push the survey link out to everybody who received a device through the MDM software. Um, additionally, my VISTAs are working uh, diligently to find training resources for our newly connected residents. I'm confident that um, with the help of my VISTAs, we will develop a robust training program with online virtual training, recorded videos, written materials, and virtual social interactions geared to reduce um, so social isolation. And did I mention that I can send everyone who got a device from me a message about upcoming training opportunities or remind people um, who signed up for a training that it's time to log on? If you can't tell, I'm really excited about that. Um, lastly, regarding future projects, um, we currently have a 200-unit property named Foothill Village, Foothill Village, which is um, undergoing uh, rehabilitation. And we are working with Cox Communication to provide managed Wi-Fi at no cost to the residents at that location. Over the next year, um, the VISTAs and I will be working together to create a managed Wi-Fi plan for our new development. Um, Jill provided capacity building examples such as writing training curriculum, developing procedures and systems, grant writing, designing marketing materials. Um, she provided a list of sustainable activities such as developing handbook, manuals, partnerships, and me mechanisms for uh, project evaluation. My VISTAs have done every one of those things, and their work directly correlates to the success and sustainability of my program. Um, I, I would like to share a little bit of advice regarding onboarding and integrating VISTAs into your team. Um, for those of you that attended the conference last year, you heard me speak about how impactful it was to my program to work with the VISTAs. I, I can't stress enough how important it is to ensure that the VISTA is a good fit for your organization, but also that you're a good fit for the VISTA. So after conducting interviews, I always reach out to the candidate that I would like to join my team so that we can have a candid discussion about the work that they're going to be doing during their year of service. Um, this gives me a chance to get to know them. It gives them a chance to learn what is important to me and how, how I am as a supervisor. I use this conversation as an opportunity to, um, to really show my passion for the work that we do here in Phoenix. Often the VISTAs are interviewing for several positions and they make their decision based on the assignment description and the interview process. So if you take the time to have a frank discussion, you should be able to tell whether or not they'd be a good fit. Typically the VISTAs are very passionate and have the desire to make an impact. So this is a good time to talk about how you envision them doing that within your program. Um, this conversation may also help them decide which position to accept if they have multiple offers on the table. So if your site is lucky enough to be selected by the VISTA, um, please give them a valuable, meaningful work. Integrate them into your team, your culture, your community. Um, invest your time in the VISTAs and it will pay off for both of you in the end. And please don't forget to thank them for their year of service. All right, great, thanks. Thanks so much, Mindy. Um, it looks like we have a few questions um, in the chat box. So 
So I'm just going to go ahead and dive into those. The first one that we have is this one is for Joan. How do you advertise and acquire volunteers for the letter postcard program? Can you share more about this program, for example, how it started and gained momentum and how it was deployed? Joan, are you on mute? Hi, can you hear right, me? Well, <laughs> yep, we can hear you. Yes, there you go. Ah, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. No worries. <laughs> Um, so our housing authority has a nonprofit building for tomorrow that we use for all our philanthropic fundraising, um, special programs for our residents. And that's really where our volunteer base comes from. Um, we do a lot of constant contact, social media, outreach um, to mainly donors or previous donors, sponsors, people who are interested in our projects. That's where we got most of our volunteers. I will tell you, um, a lot of the other leadership groups, we have um, Leadership Akron, for example, which is again, a, a nonprofit that does leadership training with upcoming young professionals. It's, it was refreshing how many of those folks needed um, volunteer hours. And during COVID, it was next to impossible to find a place to volunteer at. So that just really worked nicely. Um, and again, we just kind of pointed those folks to our um, website, our Time Counts website to register and so we could track their units or the numbers of cards that they've contributed. All right, cool, thanks. Um, so next question, and this covers actually a, a few questions that came in um, for you, Mindy, just to, with some more details about the program um, that you were so excited about for contacting residents. Um, can you just repeat again what, what that's called? And then I guess just repeat again um, sort of how it works, if it's via mobile text, if it's email, you know, kind of how is it communicated? Um, yes, okay, so there, there are many different types of mobile device management software. The one that we, re, we are using is called Hexnode, H-E-X-N-O-D-E, -E, and it's, um, it was purchased through a company called NextLink Communications, who have been fantastic to work with, by the way. Um, so MDM uses, like, I'm not a techie, so bear with me, but MDM uses client-server architecture with the devices acting as the client while the MDM server remotely pushes configurations, apps, policies, um, which manage the devices over the air. So IT admins can remotely manage mobile endpoints such as laptops, tablets, um, phones, and it leverages the notification services available to contact managed devices. So that's off the website, I think. So. Basically, the, the, the software has a really um, user-friendly portal that allows me to go in and see all of the devices that we registered, and I can do a broadcast message to, like I mentioned, to an individual device, to a group of devices, or to all of the devices registered um, in the software, and it, it becomes a pop-up notification on the devices, similar to a, de a text message or any other, um, you know, notification on the device. So it's, it's really easy to use. So I just highly recommend it. I know outreach has been challenging during these times, to say the least, and um, I think it's going to be a great resource in sharing information. We've already had other departments ask us to push out information to the, to the families that receive the tablets. And um, yeah, I envision us using it greatly over the next couple of years. All right, great, thanks. Um, and I've, just so everybody knows, I, I snatched that name and I put it in the chat box so you can grab it there too. Um, next question also for you, Mindy, um, was, the managed Wi-Fi funded from CARES Act money? It, it, is, it is not at this point. So we, um, no, it is not. The tablets and the service, but not the managed Wi-Fi. Okay, thanks. 
I think we had another one come in for you in the Q&A box um, about the last little point that you made. What type of questions do you ask VISTAs that help you weed out those who aren't necessarily a good fit? That's a good question. Um, I, don't, I, I guess I'm brutally honest. We, we did have one VISTA in the very beginning, one that I didn't hire that um, really was not good, a good fit for the program at all. And I, I, you know, I share my experience. I'm very honest about what it is that I need to accomplish over the, over the year, what some of the challenges have been. And I think it just, you know, it comes out in conversation. So it is important to me that they, like I'm looking for somebody to bring into the organization that has a passion for serving the community and it, you know, that, that isn't afraid to get their hands dirty and come in and do anything, you know, anything that it takes to get the job done. So, you know, for me, it's, it's just a general conversation and it's going to depend on the applicant. But I definitely ask about, you know, what their preference is for supervision style, if they feel that they work better independently or in a group setting. And, you know, we just, we just talk about it. So for me, I, I can tell everybody here that I would pick somebody that has a passion for the work that we do over somebody that has the developed skills and, and a lack of passion. So I can teach people how to do the job and, um, it, you know, it's it's just such important work that for me it is all about the passion, and and I've been very fortunate that you know the last handful of vistas that I've had have been um, not only great to work with but they've become friends as well. And even though Patricia and Brenda have gone back to their home states and they're no longer no longer working with us, you know they're family to me and I'm gonna stay in touch with them, you know, for forever. So. I just think it's important, you know, I think sometimes people make the mistake of treating VISTAs as interns or, you know, assistants, and that is not what they are at all. So, you know, just we need to do our part to ensure that we're giving them meaningful work. Great, Mindy, yeah, that's a, that's a good approach. Um, and then Dina, I think this is a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to post a link for the VISTA program in HUD and all its processes and expectations for using it so we can present this to leadership? Just a link will be great. Sure. So I, I think uh, maybe I'll ask Jillian if she has a, you know, a one-stop uh, URL that, that she can provide us in the chat. Um, but, but HUD doesn't really have uh, requirements. If you want to get a VISTA, you can. and. Actually, I was going to ask um, Jillian to talk a little bit about the application process um, because I know there's there's several ways of going about it, and we have had, as I said, um, the great fortune of having sort of a, a a number of Vista slots reserved for Connect Home USA. But I know you can also go um, through your state, and I, I believe there may be another way of going about that. So I'm going to turn it over to Jillian for that. Yeah, thanks so much, Dina. Um, Yes, we can. If you go back one slide, Kayla, I just wanted to chat about the application process just super quick. So like Dina mentioned, I work for the Service Collaborative of Western New York. We administer um, VISTAs in partnership with HUD. However, there are a bunch of ways to go about obtaining a VISTA member. So um, you can go through your state and local organizations. Like Mindy mentioned, I believe they use Hands On Phoenix. So they actually get one VISTA member from Hands On Phoenix and one VISTA member from us. Um, also, you can look at any other local organizations. Sometimes there's state commissions that um, you can apply for VISTA members through. So a whole bunch there, um, which is that second link. And then if you are interested in getting a member from Serve New York, you can contact me directly and I'll provide you with all the information. We don't currently have it up on a URL, um, but feel free to reach out and I can send out our RFP process. And we um, recruit for members twice a year in the summer and for March start date. And so we can talk about all the specifics with recruiting um, 
as Mindy mentioned, as a site, you always get the final say in a member, but we do other applications and interviews beforehand to try and weed out and get you the best possible candidates. So yeah, I would say the best, the best way is just to reach out directly to me or to a, a state and local agency, and we can get you all the application information. Thanks, Jillian. Great. Thanks, Jillian. Yeah. Um, that's all the questions that I'm seeing in the chat box right now, Dina, and I know, I know you had a few that you wanted to, to ask, so I'll, I'll pass it to you now. Okay, great. Um, so I guess, actually, some of the folks um, preempted me. They, they asked questions that I was thinking about. <laughs> so um, the one question I have remaining is um, how, and this is for anyone on the, on the panel, how have VISTAs uh, converted their work um, now in the time of COVID? Any tips or best practices that you have, have seen that you might be able to share? Um, hi, Dana, it's Mindy. So for, for us, we have been, um, We've been utilizing Microsoft Teams to do a lot of, um, like to do our document document sharing and um, hosting our meetings via Teams. Um, we've been doing coffee chat with our seniors using um, using Zoom. And some of our um, we have we have a a block watch in um, Eritrea, one of our one of our properties, and we're using. Facebook room meetings to do those. So, um, you know, this this round of vistas that I have are are really tech savvy. So they're actually sort of driving what we're doing, and they're providing really great input. And even though I feel like you know they're not getting the same experience as being in the office and hearing about everything else that the housing department does daily, you know, we're we're still inviting them to all of our online division meetings and all of our phone calls to, to try to get them experience to other things as well. Great, that's awesome. Anybody else? Joan or um, back? I can share too, um, just in, in my experience, Mindy, this is Jillian again. Um, we've seen a lot of, of VISTAs with Connect Home and, and our other partners as well that have just helped with making the leap to um, digital programming since COVID. So a lot of help on um, social media and um, virtual volunteer recruitment and management, which Joan mentioned, which she's probably going to talk more about. Um, but just, you know, kind of integrating the technology aspect and managing Zoom conferencing and, you know, all of that. Um, a lot of our members have switched um, to a lot of that, and, and also fundraising and grant writing as well. Um, I would say about half of our VISTAs work on some sort of fundraising and grant writing, which previously they were more in the field, um, in the office. But, yeah. Great. And that, that just reminded me, Jillian, about um, hosting a VISTA. I know that, and, and Mindy, you alluded to this, um, that you, you, you're you their supervisor, so they, they have to have a supervisor, but I believe they also have to have, in normal times, um, a, an office space, right? Yes, in normal times, they need to have an office space. Um, the Corporation for National and Community Service and AmeriCorps in general has allowed VISTAs to work remotely, full-time remote, if that's what sites are doing. It kind of depends on the site. So I have members that never stopped going into sites, and I have members that haven't been at their site in six months and aren't going for six months. Um, so and it open up, opens up a lot of possibilities, too, to have members work remotely across the country. Um, so a member... I think Mindy's member, actually, Florence, she started in, I believe, Utah and was working remotely for a week or two before she actually moved to Phoenix. Um, so there's a lot of increased possibilities, but you don't need to have an office space at this time, but you always need to have a site supervisor. So we do some management from our end, and then um, 
Joan and Mindy and Zach, they're all the direct supervisors of the members day to day at their site. Perfect. Thanks, Jillian. Yeah, and thanks everybody. Uh, looks like we don't have any questions left. Um, Dina, if you don't have any more, I think we can go ahead and wrap up. All right, thank you so much. Thanks everyone um, for participating and thanks for a great panel. You guys really painted such a complete and holistic picture of the VISTA program and, and all the benefits that, that they can provide. And, and a salient point for me was, Mindy, what you said about um, that you know you shouldn't treat them as an intern. They're they're really more than that, and and it, it, it go, the the relationship goes both ways. So, thank you again to our wonderful panel, and um, we put uh, a link into the the this to over, overall program in the chat. So there's a URL there. Just want to remind you about um, the afternoon sessions that are coming up. Um, the first one after this is tips and tricks for setting up uh, a virtual training. And then um, it's going to be followed by our, our closing session, which will feature the Census Bureau talking about what, what's, what's happening now with the Census, how you can get data that's re related to uh, computers and Internet access, and then uh, a special surprise from the Connect Home USA team and a closing from um, the Chief Executive Officer of, of Everyone On. So hopefully you'll join us for that. And thank you again for, to everyone for being on today's webinar. Have a good afternoon.